Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Paul Gibbons. Paul, welcome. Hey, thanks, man. Good to see you. So, Paul, you're a keynote speaker, uh, an expert on the crossover of business, science, ethics, and change. You've written multiple books. We'll get into yeah. that. Um, Google, Microsoft, IBM, KPMG hire you to consult on major change leadership and change management projects. When you introduce yourself, when people meet you, what do you tell them that you do? I always like turn red, like a I blush like a 13 year old teenage girl when people ask me what I do. Um, but uh, this has always been hard to pin me down. Mm. Uh, so I used to be an independent consultant, and now I mostly write. Uh, and I don't say no to consulting work, but neither do I really hunt it down. Right. Uh, so I did. I did have a consulting firm, and we grew over six years. We became I don't know five million dollars in revenue in today's money. That's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we work for the, the best of the best of the best. And I mean, uh, in England, Barclays, HSBC, Shell, British Petroleum, Cadbury Schweppes, Anglo-American Mining. So those are all in the top 10 UK firms, and those were our customers. So we did good. Yeah. So today, when someone says, Paul, what do you do? Uh, I write books. I write books, and I, and I, and I, and I do keynotes. And yeah. um, I write books uh, somewhat about business. Uh, so change management, culture change is my... Sweet spot, uh, but I'm also uh, pretty ambitious. I want to tackle uh, some problems uh, that we have in the United States, to a lesser extent in Canada. Uh, there's a book called Truth Wars, which is about uh, disinformation, media disinformation, um, political disinformation, and corporate disinformation. I'm very interested in as a business ethics guy. I'm interested in corporate disinformation, how businesses uh, manipulate reality. Exxon, mm. Exxon and climate change, for, for example. Got it. Okay. Well, you know, I want to dig into a lot of this, but let's, let's actually start from maybe a different place. And I was originally intending just based on what you mentioned, you worked with, you know, the best of the best, as you said, um, very well-known brands. How did you get to that point? So take us back to the consulting from the year running where you got them, got up to about 5 million revenue, working with some great well-known clients. What were you doing to, to land those deals? Uh, so it's more serendipity than, you know, I wish, uh, there were some, and, and this is maybe a weakness, right? Maybe a weakness in my practice today. And maybe it was a weakness right then. Some really systematic marketing uh, plan, tools, approach that we could have done. All of our contacts seem to me to be serendipitous. Now, to say that it's serendipitous doesn't mean you do jack shit. Yeah, it doesn't mean like, oh, well, you know, whatever's luck and... You know, maybe they'll come, maybe they won't. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so what were you doing? Because to create well, that serendipity, to create luck, right? There's this preparation that goes into it. There's choices that you make that put you in the right place at the right time. What, just walk, kind of take us back, memory lane. What were you doing on a, on a daily, you know, weekly, monthly basis to create those opportunities? Um, so, I think this is fact. I think if you look at consulting research, it shows that 60% of uh, consulting work is through word of mouth. And that, and that doesn't matter whether you're a Pricewater or Coopers or Accenture or McKinsey or whatever. Okay, so that's one. So you want people to say nice things about you, yeah? And surprising, the biggest jobs that we ever sold were, and I'm talking about three, four, five million dollar gigs, right? Big gigs. Uh, which for a leadership firm is, it's not a big gig if you put do system implementations. That's like, Sure. My brother does systems implementations. That'd be like 100 million, 200 million, billion dollars, you know, you know, systems implementation for the government in the UK. So like, yeah, but for a leadership for a $5 million mm -hmm. is a big land. Anyway, uh, so you want people to say those things. So, um, so what we were very good at, we were really good at networking. So we were really good at, mm -hmm. you know, hanging out with people. And I think not just networking like, uh, you know, how's your drink, buddy, and something like that, but are we constant, constantly, and this wasn't managed, talked about the stuff that we were doing that was special and exciting and unique and added values to clients. So, uh, we, and we did that because we believed in it. So and, we and, were, and how did you do that? So like, it sounds like you weren't just going to the pub and having a, a shandy or a pint of Guinness. There was something else going on. What, what were you doing to, you know, to share that information? Were you inviting people to an event? Were you going to a, an event that was held by another association or, or group? Just kind of like walk us through a little bit more tangible for everyone. That stuff's very American. We don't do much of that in Europe. Um, 
but so it was more like the pub and the shandy, the sort of more networking events. I mm -hmm. never went to, I never went to any. Okay. Um, zero. So would you, would you invite, so for example, let's just say HSBC or whoever, would you say, Hey, would love to, to, you know, grab a, a pint of beer with you and, and chat about this specific topic. Yeah, but it was more incoming than outgoing. I know that sounds strange. I, I like to hang out with people who have interesting views about mm. the world. I like to hang out with consultants who are up to stuff, who I think are visionary, smart, knowledgeable, and delivering value. And a lot of referrals came from inside the consulting network. So other consultants mm. would say, go talk to my boy, Paul Gibbons. But I mean, the main thing is that Look, I have this saying that if you put all the proposals, we did a lot, we did competitive proposals at the beginning, not so much at the end. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, a consultant, like a competitive proposal is like, okay, you know, we're going to be a one in 10 shot or a one in 20 shot. And you're, you're referring to like an RFP type of RFP type proposal. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we did that. I mean, sometimes we replied to government RFPs. So there might have been 300 people pitching and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we got one of them, but it's a numbers <clears> game. Uh, we weren't doing that by the end. It was all. I mean, when it really works well is uh, uh, we went into uh, Cadbury Shrips one morning. Um, uh, we had a connection there. Uh, one of the younger, so one of the younger people in the firm, so he was like 24, 25, said, uh, oh, you'd like you to meet my boss. He knew this guy. And um, so in I go. And uh, this guy was like, after 20 minutes, was like, great, well, let's do some work together. <laughs> like, all right, then. He's like, well, here's a couple of problems we have. He brought a couple of people in. He asked his assistant to send a couple of people upstairs. And we met with them and he said, can I have a proposal by Friday? It was like, and, and why? Why did he do that? What, were you, what did you do in that meeting, in yeah, that it's a, it's environment? A, it's, a great, it's a great question. It's a great What did I do? You know, we were doing some very special leadership development work. I mean, we were you know, I'm going to say this, right? We were the best in the, I think we were the best in the UK. Uh, and how do we, how do we develop that stuff? We developed mm -hmm. that stuff because the leadership development stuff that we were doing was uh, harvested from literally the best that we could find. So this is, the found, firm was founded in 2000. So I'm talking about this like a decade ago, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the best we could find from around the world. Like the people that were working with that on my team were so curious Mm. about the best stuff we were in personal development workshops on weekends we were you know reading all the books we were working hard and mm. we were also working hard to apply that shit in our programs and then paul so, give me an example because i think it's easy for someone to say yeah, yeah you know, know, we, know. We, every, we have, every, every every consultant thinks right so, so give me an example like what was someone else doing when it came to leadership training or development and uh, and engagements and then what were you doing at that time that was different so we wouldn't do any one day course. So we wouldn't do anything that someone said, Hey, you know, can you come and do a, a leader, day's leadership training? I said, you'd be wasting your money. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to develop uh, a, a leader takes, you know, it's, it's more like golf, right? You can show someone a video on how to swing a golf club and then they sort of abstractly know like, Oh, okay. That's how you swing a golf club. Right. right. But to get truly excellent at mm -hmm. playing golf, you're going to swing that thing 20,000 times. And leadership is a bit like that. So you don't teach it from textbooks. You know, I, I have this, one of my new books that I'm writing, I'm saying like, all right, are there great leaders in the world who have not read any books on leadership? Mm. What would you say? What would you say? Like, oh, you just do intuition. They haven't read or ever read a book on leadership. Well, I mean, so, I mean, one person comes to mind who, who doesn't, I don't, I don't think reads books, yeah. um, but I'm sure is influenced by the environment around them. So Bill Gates famously never, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, yep. none of us has ever read a book on leadership. And I mean, mm. Gates Gate is fiercely proud of that, right? Um, and uh, are there people who are really appalling leaders who have read every leadership book that's ever dropped there, out of There must be. Yeah. yeah, right. So what's the value? <laughs> mm. What's the value of what's in the leadership books? This is a question just like, not very good. maybe not, there's maybe not that much in there. Uh, leadership is a set of concepts. It's practices that you do day in and day out, talking about the vision, talking about what's exciting, talking about the latest proposition. You know, it's that constant work of getting people, customers and staff really excited about the work that you're doing, the product that you're doing. And really and sincerely, because I don't think it's that, I mean, faking it will get you so far. I mean, you know, people who sell vacuum cleaners for a living, I don't suppose that they can get authentically super duper excited. But we believed in, better leaders, for better businesses, for a better world. That was our vision. And we spoke that all the time. And staff were excited about it. So when staff had a coffee with someone, they couldn't help. It's like seeing the best movie you ever saw. It's like they couldn't help but say, wow, this is amazing. You know, you know, they're not selling. 
they're just speaking like what's there for them right now is I just saw this amazing movie or I just ran this amazing program. What I'm, what I'm taking from this, yeah. Yeah, from what I'm taking from this, Paul, is it's not that you are saying, hey, we have a better framework or a methodology or we're going to come and take you through our PowerPoint and show you why we're, we're better. And feel free to jump in and correct if I'm wrong here. You, you are being very straight. You are, uh, maybe as you are right now, direct about really what you what, what it takes to succeed. You, you weren't holding any punches. You weren't taking work yeah. that would just generate yeah. revenue. Uh, it had to be you know, an engagement where you really felt that yeah. true change could, could happen. Um, and that, um, that energy, that yeah. level of commitment is maybe what separated you from others. Would that be? Yeah, well, the employee experience, the people that worked for me, they were excited. So we always mm. focus on getting the customers excited. But as I've said to you, all of our work came from sort of or these organic looking referrals. Mm -hmm. And that was because the staff were excited. So right. as, I, as I say in one of my recent books, that your customer experience drives, uh, your employee experience yeah. drives your customer experience. Yeah. If you have excited, engaged, motivated learners working yes. for you, the customers are going to go, damn, I want some of them. I want what they have. So how do you do that? Because I think there's, there's you know, consultants, founders listening to this right now who, who have a team, maybe it's only five or, or 10 people, um, and they're thinking to themselves, well, but I've always put myself at the front. I've, I've been the, the expert, the authority. I've, I've shot, you know, kind of put the spotlight on, on myself, my articles, my speaking. I have, I've, my, my team has kind of done the work. They've helped with administration. They've helped with delivering the work, but I haven't actually put the spotlight on, on them. What did you do? Yeah. To, to get your team to the point where they had that, that level of energy and excitement and essentially were, were drawing in opportunities for your firm. Yeah, uh, they, they would bring them in and they might well say, you want to meet my boss, but they were you know, often excited enough and competent enough to speak to it. Myself. So one of the things that I did when we did, so our conversion ratio was insane. So when, uh, when we got to the proposal stage, as unfortunately, none of us likes that, but unfortunately that's part of being consultant, right? And you get to the proposal stage and you have to write a document. And sometimes it's a hundred page document, sometimes a five page document. Uh, I've written more hundred page documents uh, than five page documents. It's mm -hmm. nice when you can write, you can write them a five page letter and yes. they say, okay, okay, here's 150 grand, right? That's nice. Uh, it doesn't happen. You know, it's certainly not the first time you work for them. It doesn't happen that way. Anyway, so I used to say, if you put a proposal from, we're going to be here, we're going to be pitching into Accenture and KPMG and the Center for Creative Leadership and Harvard Business School, Duke Business School, mm -hmm. we're going to be pitching against the best in the freaking world, right? And so those are our competitors. So, so let's not kid ourselves, right? This is a gig for HSBC Bank and it's got $2 million price tag. And so everybody, everybody wants to win this gig, including the Dukes and the Harvards and the NCIs and the Oxford. Okay, so that, that's the reality of the situation, right? We're not favorite, right? You're looking at these horses, right? And they're like, you look at Harvard, and you look at, you got a little shitty ass consultancy that we were next to a power plant in Battersea in England, right? I mean, you know, so how are we going to win this? So, so that's, first of all, like there's a certain hunger. Mm. I have a very competitive agent. It's like, all right. I'm not going to waste my time writing this. We are going to kick their ass. So you're kind of rallying the troops. You're, you're yeah, getting, you're, yeah, but also myself. Like I, I'm not going to waste my time writing a 100-page freaking proposal, which takes three weeks, and lose. <laughs> so, 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 so then, first of all, I do things in my proposals that I think are so, so there are people that start proposals with uh, some, you know, really bullshitty business talk. You know, thank you for inviting me. And, just were really honored and everything like that. And our firm was it's like, dude, oh my God, please. I, I always used to say they, they should want to buy what you're selling. They should want to pick us by the end of the first paragraph. Mm. So, so right? what do you do? Just more. You lead with their needs. You lead mm. with their needs, right? The thing, you know, the thing is you lead with your best punch, you know, and you say, uh, geez, it's been so long since I wrote the proposal. I can't remember the sort of thing you used to say. Start with, you mean you might start with, look, you probably have 100 people pitching for this, right? Let me tell you right now what they're all going to say that won't deliver value, right? For example, yeah? You'll be choosing from the best business schools in the world, the best consulting firms in the world. And here's the thing that they miss. And you get their attention like, oh, whoa. And then mm. they want to read the rest of the proposal. So yeah. don't bury your goodies on page 68 because let's be honest, nobody reads page 68. 
Yeah. If, if they're not sold by the bottom of the first page, you've wasted your time. So anyway, so very top down. So really mm -hmm. the, the key selling messages, I, I, I did at this firm, at this firm Corn Ferry. I mean, I ended up helping the proposal. There's a, something like that. I was like, they had their key differentiators on like the 15th PowerPoint slide. I'm like, what the fuck? Put them like right there. Because if you put a KPMG proposal and an Accenture proposal on an Oxford, if you put these side by side, you take off the logos, can you tell the difference? Yeah. So they say it about websites as well, right? You get a bunch of people in a similar yeah. industry, exactly. you just remove their logos, remove Look. a few things, and they're all, they're, everything's the yeah. same. They all look said, they yeah. all got the same pretty pictures, they all got the same three column structure with the, yeah, right. So, Take that off. What is going to be special? So, so that sort of desire to that absolute commercial need. When you're the when you're the underdog, you have to stand out. It's not a luxury to say the same old, same old bullshit things that the other ten people are going to say. Because if you do that, as the firm that we were, Future Considerations, they wouldn't even look at you. Yeah. You wouldn't even. I mean, they're like, who are these guys? You know, when I've got like Harvard and Oxford here, so they just toss that in the bin and they say, okay. Um, so, so you have to scream from the very beginning why you are better than the best in the world. That's and a really, really important message. So, Paul, I want to ask you, um, yeah, you know, yeah. consult, it's hard to draw the connection between philosophy and improving their consulting business, <laughs> right? How do you leverage your knowledge of, of science and philosophy to help leaders create and run better businesses? Well, that was in my, uh, uh that, 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 um, this is more of my writing lesson than how I built a mm -hmm. consulting firm. So uh, one of the things I'm interested in management pseudoscience. So one of the things that um, is how do you know what you know, right? And a lot of managers rely on their gut to make decisions. But if you look at behavioral science and books like, I don't know if any of them behind me, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's not thinking fast and slow, predictably irrational. All these books on behavioral science, you find your gut's a very, very, it's like the worst thing you can do, right? Is trust your gut for important, complex, risky decisions because mm -hmm. we have cognitive biases. We have cognitive biases that are inherited from when we were living on the savanna. And it was better, for example, to see a tiger that wasn't real than it was to not see a tiger. Like false, false negatives cost you a lot more than a false positive, to put mm. it in sort of mathematical terms. Anyway, so, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and so, so the whole philosophy of knowledge or epistemology is what you know. So basically, this leads into, well, today we have data organizations that are using data science. But you can't just all of a sudden have your data science implementation without people in the firm that know how to understand and use data, right? You're wasting your money. Because unless everybody in your firm is data friendly, and what does that mean? That means they're using data rather than their gut. Yeah, for one thing. But they have a culture, they have a, you have a data culture so that when you're arguing for ideas in a meeting or something like that, you have the facts or the evidence behind you. So was it, um, I can't remember who said this, so he said, um, something, what, what, something, everybody else, every, yeah. everybody else bring data. He said, yeah, uh, something like God, God goes for free, but everybody else better, better bring me the data. Anyway, yeah. So that's one of the things that you saw is philosophy of knowledge. It's business ethics. So it's philosophy ethics um, is a lot of what I teach in my MBAs right now. So, and Paul, do you find that, so your books now, I mean, you shifted, from doing a lot of consulting work to, to writing and to doing a lot more speaking is are, are the books bringing you the speaking opportunities? If you kind of look I, at your, your business I, right now, I don't do nearly the amount of speaking that I could or should be doing was partly because when I'm writing, I really like to cocoon myself. So that's mm. one thing It's partly just like, I, it's partly an attention issue. It's very hard. It's like writing almost have to be, like clear my calendar for nine months. And mm. not many people have that luxury, but because I sold the consulting firm in 2010, I, I, I have the luxury of taking nine months and just writing a book. The second thing is I write books just because I want the books to be great books. You so know? you're not writing a book with the intention, like many people to put the book out there that leads to speaking and it leads to consulting and leads to, yeah. it, no. They don't have, I, they have, uh, I mean, if I, I write books because I, I, I want to say something original and interesting and controversial. Mm. I do that. And if that lands me speaking gigs, that's wonderful.
Well, and does that, do, you, do you think that that comes because you sold the consulting firm? It gives you the ability not to necessarily think about money as much as maybe someone else, or is that just you? Like, this is how you've been and you are. Uh, I, the reason I didn't write for a very long time is that I wanted to write the kind of book that I would read. Mm. And I think that a lot of what I read in the leadership and change and transformation is not the sort of book that I would even waste five minutes on. Mm. Why not? You know, uh, they're repetitive. They say the same things. I mean, right. there are books like John, John Maxwell on leadership. I don't think there's hardly a valuable word in them. He's got 28 books on leadership. Uh, people I do like, like there's a Stanford professor called um, Jeffrey Pfeffer. He's one of the best guys in human resources. If uh, you're a leader, he's written a book called Leadership VS, which is why a lot of the stuff, and you know, he's Professor Emeritus Stanford in the 70s or 80s or something like that, mm. or something like that. He questions a lot of what we think of as management wisdom. Let me give you one example. MBTI, right? Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. You ever heard of it? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Huh? So has everybody. Everybody's done it. I've done it 10 times. I used to run workshops on it right now. Psychologists hate it. It's got no validity. Mm. You know, it's sort of like, uh, I can't remember the two <clears> women, <throat> if it were two women or a woman and a man. It's sort of like they pulled out this framework out of their backside, so to speak, <laughs> and have turned it into a, the a survey industry, a billion dollar industry. Right. Now, you say that to people who are making their living, like doing Myers-Briggs, as I have done in the past, 25, 30 years ago, or something like that. And it's like a horrible thing to hear, that it's mm. pseudoscience. The same thing with learning styles. Learning styles right. are pure pseudoscience. But there are people who are making a living. Right. Things. So I'm kind of the guy who's like, where's the data? Where's the facts? Where's the evidence? And where's the truth? Can we mm. cut, the, can, cut the bullshit and try and produce some results here? So that's my, that's my shtick. Does it make me popular? No. Uh, but I sell it, maybe the two change books are bestsellers. So they're sort of popular in a way. And, and, and so let's just talk about the books for, for a moment. How yeah. are you getting the books to, to be bestsellers? Do you have a team behind you? Is it all your publisher? Are you doing something specific like you've figured they're, out they're, how to they're, get they're it out good, there? They're good books. No, I, I know, do, but you know, I, I, you do, I, do, I do no marketing. I don't do any marketing. So you don't books. jump on podcasts. There's no, well, I do a little bit here, but I remember I do a podcast a month or something like that. So how do people know when your, when your book is available, how do they know that it's available? Oh, I have mailing list, but it's very small. It's like 1,000, 1,200 people. It's not very big. So you, so you send that out and, and that creates a bestseller book? Well, it's bestseller category. So let's, let's, be, let's be fair. So the number one book on change, you know, the science of organizational change mm -hmm. is uh, top three or top two on Amazon. If you, if you Google organizational change or change yeah. on Amazon, it's like top two or three. So does that make it a bestseller? Maybe not in the absolutely technically, it's not on the New York Times bestseller list, right? No, no, like but I, I get what you mean, but it's, it's, it's being yeah. read by, by many people. And, yeah, and what you're you know, saying is you it sells thousands of dollars a month. You know, it sells two, right. three, four, five thousand dollars a month worth of stuff, which is a lot for a business book, right? Mm -hmm. Especially one that was written in 2013, right? It still sells 500 copies a month or a thousand copies. And, a and month. when you say, let's say, like, you know, three, four, five thousand a month, is that what you are getting from the book or that's just yeah. top line? So that's what you're receiving no, from the book. What I, that's what I'm getting from the book. Yeah. Got it. Got yeah. it. Um, let's so, talk about so, so, so I wrote the books because I wanted to write books yeah. and I wanted to write books that were interesting, controversial, that had new ideas in them. Uh, I did not want to write a boring book. Uh, I hate that. What so advice would, I, would you, would you have for someone who wants to write a book? Cause a lot of people want to get a book out of them. They feel they have it in there. They may even feel like it's, you know, obligatory, but, but they're, they just, I, they haven't matter? started. Well, I don't know. Does it matter? I mean, what mm. do you think? I mean, you're the ex. I, I defer to your expertise because I have only run and started one consulting firm and, you know, okay, we were successful, but there's enough luck in life, you know, that say, maybe I, maybe I had a lucky decade, um, but there's enough luck in life. You've seen more people. And so you're the best person who's best place to advise. Should you write a book? Uh, I wouldn't write a shitty book. Um, yeah. But, what, what, what about, so not so much in terms of should someone write a book, but when any best practices or, um, you know, principles, approaches that you use to write a book that you found have been helpful for you, that to help someone get a book out, to get it, you know, to get it going, to create and develop a, a, a great here. book. Yeah, here's a, here's, a, here's a really good, super practical piece of advice. Every book should start with a preface. And in that mm. preface should say, why I thought it was important to write that book. Mm. And so maybe you're stuck. You don't know whether you can write a book. You don't know whether you should write a book. Mm -hmm. You don't know whether you have the motivation to write a book. You don't know whether you've not got enough good stuff in your head to fill a book, right? All that may be true. Mm -hmm. 
but you feel like there's something you ought to pay attention to, write the preface. Mm. This is why I'm writing the book for you. This is why yeah. uh, nice. this story, the stories that I want to tell you, this is why I think they will change your life in some mm. respect. Write that's that. What, now that's yeah. only two freaking pages. So you can write that in an afternoon. It doesn't have to be Shakespeare. Yeah. Write yeah. that in an afternoon and then take a look at it. And you know that will either catalyze you to think, wow, damn, yeah. It's a way of helping yourself think through the reading and it's going to be at the beginning of your book anyway. Right. So, so get right that. And then, and then, you know, there are many other steps like that. Then think about yeah. outline no, that, and that, ideas and research. That, that's and a great idea, step. Idea, you know. Yeah. No, I appreciate yeah. that. I think that's a, a different, I haven't heard that before, but it makes like, as soon as you said, I was like, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that's a great way to get started. So you published a book last year. You said you have another um, one coming, I believe, but uh, last year was the book called impact. Uh, which is all yeah. about what leaders must know to lead in the 21st century, correct? Digital transformation. So leading digital transformation, change yeah. management and digital transformation. Yeah. For, for all the consultants out there, is that the book? If there was one book that you put out that you feel for someone running a consulting business uh, would be beneficial for them or just knowing what you know that you would suggest, is it that book or is it a different book that they should the, the, the yellow book, The Science of Organizational Change. Okay. I, I, I mean, that's the book I wrote in 2013 that's still top of the charts. So mm. it's, it's a book that basically says, for both my books say this, but lots of what you've read about change is bullshit. And, and we need more science and change because right now, a lot of the methodologies used to change are either stuff like Myers-Briggs or learning styles, or uh, there's stuff that people have made out like four box models or eight step models or six mm -hmm. box models or the pyramid model or the up your arse model or whatever. So there's, there's that. <laughs> so where's the science that justifies you, you know, mm -hmm. saying that that's a model that's useful to use. Uh, so the other one, uh, science of organizational change is, is really very good. Uh, impact is sells, sells less well. I'm very proud of it. It's got some interesting stuff on, how you de-bias organizations. So we know you have cognitive biases, right? You know, we've always said like everybody has cognitive biases except for me if they don't get rid of their cognitive biases. But we all have them. So what do you do about that? So what do you know about this thing? Everybody knows about behavioral science. We all have cognitive biases and confirmation bias and we all have filter bubbles. So what do you do about that in your business? If you have people who are regularly making poor decisions because of cognitive biases, which they are, I guarantee, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the obvious one is the planning fallacy, right? You know about planning fallacy if you're a consultant, right? There was an e experiment done at Stanford University where they said, how long will it take you to complete this term paper? What's your bottom estimate for the best case? Three weeks. What's your worst case estimate? Six weeks. The average time in which the term, the term paper was turned in was like nine and a half weeks or something like that. That's called the planning fallacy, right? And we mm -hmm. all know it in consultants is that because we assume when we draw our little Gantt chart in our head, you know, we're making a lot of, generally speaking, fairly favorable assumptions about the way the world is going to work out for us. This applies to writing books. It applies to consulting projects. It applies to almost everything you tackle in luck is that the world doesn't quite work out as smoothly as you would have liked. So you know that your team have this thing called the planning fallacy. And you know when they say, here's the plan and the milestones and the timeline and the deliverables, you know, as a leader, that they may be, they're well-intentioned, but it's probably wrong, right? It's probably fatally optimistic in many ways. And you're using that in capital budgeting. So what do you do about that is the question. So there's a good chapter on that in my book. Uh, the book I've got coming out this summer, uh, this January is going to be uh, <laughs> republishing a book I, I first tackled almost 20 years ago. Uh, it's on purpose and meaning at work. Uh, spirit, you know, spirituality and religion in the workplace. So let me ask you a quick question uh, kind of related yeah. to that topic, Paul. Yeah. In, in business and life, entrepreneurship, um, you know, everything that you have going on, people often focus on, on the outcome, on kind of the destination, on, on the end result that they want. And they don't focus as much uh, on the journey, but yet the journey is where we spend a lot more of the time. What, what's your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, you got to enjoy the journey, baby. You're going to spend a lot more time journeying than you're going to be outcoming. That's for damn sure. That applies to parenting and that applies mm -hmm. to proposals and consulting businesses and marriages and all like that. You got to enjoy the ride. Uh, uh, so yeah, so that's for sure. Um, and then um, this goes back to the beginning of our sales conversation is all right. You should have targets and metrics and targets you want to hit, but it's really the means that you want to be focusing on. 
It's like, how are we generating these conversations and who are we being when we're having these sales conversations? Mm. And as I said before, it's kind of a holistic thing. Like my staff, we had great methodologies. Our staff were excited about them. They were talking to friends about that. And serendipitously, we generated this virtuous world where we were doing great work, getting people excited, getting staff excited, getting more incoming work from interesting customers. And we had this beautiful virtuous cycle, you know, for almost a decade. Um, and, and, it, and, it was, and it was beautiful to watch and it was serendipitous and it, it, it looks unmanaged and chaotic. Like we didn't have a marketing plan. I know that's horrifying to many people. Uh, uh, would I do it the same way? Do, would I do it the same way today? No, I would probably have a marketing. I would probably have a social media and marketing person today. But yeah. back at back in the in the two thousands, <clears throat> it worked um, for you. It worked for me. That's all I can say. Well, listen, Paul. I want to thank you for coming on. Really appreciate you sharing I a bit hope, of your, I hope, your journey. I, hope I wasn't too offensive, you know. Whatever, uh, you know. We'll we'll, uh, we'll make we'll do our best to make sure. I'll, I'll make a note here for the team to to put a little uh, sensor icon or whatever it is they know they need to know. Uh, Are you kidding so me? I, I was like deliberately swore like 10 times less than I ever swear <laughs> in my life. Normally, like I would swear like 10 times more. I'm, uh, even, wearing, I'm even wearing a t-shirt. That, never mind. I'll show you that t-shirt. Okay. But um, uh, yeah, you caught me unawares here. So I usually- all, all good. Listen, I really appreciate you coming on. I want to make sure that people can learn more about you and your work and, and your books. Uh, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, PaulGibbons.net. There we go. Uh, right. We'll have that linked up also in the show notes, everyone. Paul, again, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for being in touch, man. I much appreciate it.